Welcome everyone, I am Duango AC, Keeper of TaskBot. I have with me here TI Kevin 83 and Media Magnet. We have a couple of slides about who we are. I am the president of the North Bay Linux Users Group. I'm an advocate for, uh, for open source software and self-learning. I also do some software engineering at Siena as my day job. I am the ambassador for taskvideos.org. So if you go to taskvideos.org, I am on site staff there, amazingly. They are crazy. Uh, over here we have Media Magnet at the end. I uh, made it, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay, I don't mind. So this is Media Magnet, he is a Twitch streamer. I'll let him explain who he is. I also uh, speed run the Stanley Parable. Um, find me at twitch.tv slash Media Magnet. Or on Twitter, between Media Magnet game, I couldn't actually just get Media Magnet. And I'm also, I do tasks. And I work in server support at Dell. And I'm TyKevin83. I speed run Pokemon Yellow's glitchless category in RTA and also the backyard baseball six inning and nine inning categories. Uh, I'm sixth in yellow RTA and I'm a former world record holder in backyard baseball. And I just did the tasks of Pokemon Yellow's glitchless category. Uh, that's a really fun one. I'm on Twitch at TyKevin83, Twitter at TyKevin83, and I do web development for Makatawa Bank in Michigan. So what I want to talk today about is start with the basics of what most people in this room know, but some people in the talk that are watching it later online won't. Although if you're watching, you probably do. But just for the sake of completeness, we're going to talk about speedrunning and human limits. So human speedrunning has been around for a while. Uh, it, the inspiration was in-game completion timers. Metroid was a classic example. Depending on how fast you completed the game, you would end up with different graphics at the end of the uh, in end of completing the, the game. And uh, sometimes people started just speeding, speed running to get to the end as fast as they could, generally any percent, but sometimes you do some pretty crazy things like low percent, no major glitches, or other categories. And Speed Demos Archive has really been kind of the forerunner to what, I guess you might say that they were the established place for all speedrun records, and still are. There's still some other websites that have popped up since then, but I would say SDA is still very relevant even today. And there are other websites that track the fastest completion times from humans. There are very strict rules, especially for SDA. Peer reviews, make sure there, no one is using any cheats, macros, anything that might augment human play. And they're typically very entertaining because it's, it's human skill on display. Now contrast that to tool-assisted speedruns or super plays. You're moving from human limits to hardware limits. And, and a tool-assisted speedrun or a TAS, that word can be used any way you like. A ta I'm, a, I'm a TAS or working on Tetris. Anyway, you get the idea. Well, it has an interesting lineage. It actually started all the way back in Doom. So a lot of people don't remember the tools that got added in to allow things like Doom done quick to be done even quicker. <laughs> but the idea was you'd be able to use save states, you'd be able to play the game in slow motion, and record your progress and make a movie file, was what it was referred to as. And it was, it was pretty impressive what they were able to do. Well, in 2003, a video started circulating around the web. It was an 18 megabyte WMV file released in 2003 that was just insane. I mean, you had Mario getting right ne next to, to Flowers and he, he was getting 99 lives and this guy was playing insanely well. And it was really controversial because once people started looking into it, they realized it was made with tool-assisted uh, speedrun techniques. Frame, in, not necessarily frame advance at the time, but slow motion, save states. It was made in Fantasia by someone named Morimoto. And the problem was that the video that was circulated didn't say that it was made with tools. And the issue really was that it was inhuman skill on display. The really key point here is that when you're doing tool-assisted speedruns, Tools mean that the hardware become, becomes a limit. It's not human Olympics, a limit. And, and really, it, testing looks like the doped Olympics, right? If, if you go in and you say, I'm completely clean, and you're competing in the Olympics, and, and you're, you're, you're lying, and you're actually amped up on something, that, that doesn't work very well. Well, that's basically how the speedrunning community looked at this. And really, if you're going to dope in the, anti, in, the, in the doped Olympics, then you should admit to doping. And to take that analogy one step further, videos made with task tools should be labeled as such. So if, if you're gonna compete in the Olympics while you're doped, you should say you are, <laughs> just saying. Uh, so to kind of solve this problem, in 2004, Bisquit, well, technically late 2003, Bisquit made NES videos, which eventually became task videos, and it's now the de facto location for tool-assisted speedruns. It's a pretty good repository of all kinds of speedruns, uh, or tool-assisted speedruns for all kinds of different platforms, not just Nintendo. 
now there's a few things that happened over time. The biggest one was definitely emulation accuracy becoming more advanced. In the early days, especially Fantasia, if you go back and watch that original Morimoto video, the sound is weird, the effects don't sound right, the speed is kind of funny. They worked, you could play the game, but it wasn't exactly right. Well, through the process of clean room reverse engineering or just flat out stealing manuals, a lot of people move, were able to work on these different emulators and move them from poor, use a poor uh, accuracy to really high accuracy. Sometimes certain emulators went too far, like BSNES and Huygen, and they resulted in extremely good accuracy, but not necessarily the best usability. But that's okay. The point, though, is that these were able to match hardware frame by frame. And one of the examples you can see in the screenshot is in early emulators, the transparency of that cloud in Kirby couldn't be seen correctly. It was just an opaque green cloud. And later emulators were able to properly show the transparency that you see in the lower right. There's a large number of emulators out there for a bunch of different platforms, specifically NES. There's a couple of different emulators for NES. I, I like FCEUX because obviously I'm running Linux and everything, LSNES, and a bunch of others. Uh, there's also some re-recording re -recording frameworks. They aren't properly emulators, and probably the most well-known of those is Hourglass. It is not an emulator, it is a framework that allows you to record sequences of button presses in Windows into a, uh, <clears throat> a Windows TAS file, or a WTF file. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love them with a sense of humor. This was what Cave Story was originally made with. There's also a couple of other weird re-recording frameworks. I made one for tasking the game NetHack. It's pretty crazy. Uh, it's this entire mess of Python scripts around KVM, virtual machines, and it works really well. But we're, we're, we started working on the NetHack tasks in 2010. It's now 2018. We hope we can finish in the next two years. We're at 35,000 words describing what we're doing. <laughs> anyway, so som sometimes we end up with cases where we're doing frameworks for specific games. And if you are here at the event and the Celeste TAS makes the incentive of $65,000, which is a tall order, if it makes it in, you will see a re-recording framework made specifically just for Celeste. So keep your eyes open for that. Now, what I want to kind of hand over here is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see, see how well this works. We didn't exactly test this really great. We're going to hand this over to Media Magnet, and he's going to show you some Frame Advance stuff. So Frame Advance is a... Um way to basically pick your your movement as you go along. You kind of hold down a key, hit the button to move forward, it does the thing in a very basic. When he's getting set up here, I'll just move through these slides pretty quickly. As he just said, it does event, allow you to advance 1 60th of a second. For most games, they're, they're 60 frames a second. So ignore the, the task that are part on the right-hand side. More of what, what I was doing, I was working on the same kind of thing that uh, Tina ended up doing for his, his interview segment the other day, yesterday. Yeah. For context, Tina Hacks made a task in BizHawk, the BizHawk emulator, of a ROM hack made by Mitch Flowerpower showing this really interesting effect in Super Mario Brothers 3 that's not well known. And uh, Media Magnet made one as well inside of, BizHawk, I'm sorry, inside of FCUX with this task editor view open. So you're going to see a little bit of a sneak preview of what you're going to talk about. Right. But go ahead. So what I was doing was like holding down, uh, you see that little held thing? You can just... All right, so I want to hold A, and now I'll just keep pressing A, and it's going to, if I had record on, it would actually do things. It would actually would cause A to be held the whole time as I'm walking through the frames. So, I just died. <laughs> <laughs> but it will cause, so like in my, uh, actually better one, me. I know which one I actually used it in. Oh, a different run? Yeah, a different run. Oh, that's okay. We do need to move on pretty quick, but yeah, while you're just, doing that, just keep going. Then. Yeah, yeah. So we do have the uh, we have a couple of things, right? You can you can make your life easier. Tasking in a lot of ways, if you're doing it that way, it's almost like using a corded keyboard. If you've ever heard of that, you're going to hold down maybe run right for great justice. So you're going to hold whatever key you've bound on your keyboard to the right button on your controller, whatever key you've bound to run, you know, yeah. B whatever the case may be. And while you're holding those two keys, then you're gonna hit a third key to say advance the emulator one frame. So you just tap that button and then it, it accepts that input and then you just keep changing what buttons you're holding as you continuously keep tapping the frame advance like button. That, 
like a bottom middle picture there, the held. That was the auto hold. That's the auto hold. It's going to basically constantly hold down left, and in, in this case, it was for defender. So you're going to constantly hold down left and shoot, which is A. Yeah. So let's move on to the next little bit. So there's some other crazy things you can do, like memory searching and disassembly tools. You can add in entire Lua scripting to really take it to the next level. And it's more than just frame advance and save states. It's really taking things to the next level. So you can see here in the lower section of the screen, you've got Mario with a specific speed. You can see he's going right over the top of this fire flower at the maximum speed you could. You can use these to make it easier to figure out, am I moving Mario at the most optimal speed based on peeking into memory and showing that on screen? And you can even disassemble an entire RAM or ROM. Uh, and Binary Ninja is a reverse engineering tool, kind of like Ida Pro, that is a little more flexible, especially for this kind of case. This is extraordinarily extreme. Very few things need to get to this level. But when we did the Super Mario Brothers 3 17 frame, less than one second completion of the game, we needed to fully understand every last bit of what the controller uh, code was doing. And so by disassembling the ROM inside of a, an, an IDE that's designed to help you with reverse engineering, it really helped to see what the branching code paths were and take that, that, that code and make it a little bit more understandable. So kudos to Binary Ninja for making an absolutely amazing product. And Jordan and Rusty are just awesome folks. So. I'm going to give you guys a quick overview of some of the more advanced features of using BizHawk's Task Studio to script inputs. So once you get through the basic concept of uh, scripting those inputs with frame advance, you can open up the Task Studio editor. There's a quick picture on the left there of how to get it to it in BizHawk. And you can also open the uh, memory tools so you can see what's going on in memory at the same time and help you uh, move forward with frames at the same time that you're looking at those important addresses and line things up. So uh, the Task Studio helps you visualize all the inputs you're seeing over a bunch of frames and see patterns that emerge. Uh, let's see, you go. oh, you got the next slide, there you go. So, we're going to go through starting out a task on the TI-83 calculator, actually, in Task Studio. There's a core. The uh, way BizHawk works, there's cores for each system you want to emulate. So BizHawk is the overarching platform for tasking, and then each platform, like the Game Boy, TI-83, NES, SNES, any of those things have a core. And the Task Studio can work with any of those cores and let you script inputs. So the first thing you've got to do is figure out how your inputs are mapped. The TI-83 is awesome. It has like 40 buttons. So it's really difficult to figure out what all the buttons are. But there, you can look through on your control scheme there. And what we found out is that the O button is how it, uh, it can turn on. You actually have to turn on the TI-83 calculator as the first action of your task because the true on is when you insert the CMOS batteries. So. Um, we binary search for inputs anytime we're looking for the first input we want to do. And what you basically do is you just spray an input. So like for this instance, the first thing we need to do is press the on button. We did this giant stream of on presses. And you can see how over the few uh, images we have there, we narrow down the on press from uh, 60 frames to, oh, maybe just try going through frame 30. Oh, we're still getting that power on where you can see mem cleared shows up. That shows that the TI-83 powered on. Well, maybe we need to do even fewer frames. So then we went down to uh, just between frames of, I think, like 15 and 25. And we narrowed it all the way down for going from both sides so we're not starting any earlier or finishing any later than we need to. Uh, just doing those three frames, I think uh, it's either 18 through 20 or 19 through 21 are the optimal frames for powering on the calculator. And then... From there, once you've figured out that, you can just keep going with all the rest of your inputs that you need to do for whatever tasks. Next one. Yeah. So why are we messing with the TI-83 calculator? Well, we wanted to speed code the 1985 DOS game Daleks on the TI-83 calculator and then play the game after coding it. So I'll explain quickly how the game works. There's one enemy that gets added every level you have eight direction controls, up, down, left, right, and diagonal. You have infinite teleports to any random map location via the TARDIS. But <laughs> it's kind of dangerous to use that because you can land on top of a Dalek and uh, die. And then you also have one use of the sonic screwdriver 
per level, which kills surrounding Daleks, but then if you use that, you can't use it again, so again, kind of dangerous. Um, t the task codes the game and then plays the game after coding it in the TI basic. So uh, we're gonna show you how that happens here. Go for it. it hasn't started yet. Yep. There we go. So it's fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fast. This is an example of speed coding. Bisquit and Adelicat have both, both dabbled in this in the past where they, they show what it would look like if you could write code at extremely fast, uh, perfect code, extremely quickly, no mistakes, and it actually compiles and runs. <laughs> mm -hmm. and we're making uh, complex use of the list functions and uh, some other list comparison operations you can do in TI Basic to script these inputs. Um, it's really complicated. <laughs> yeah. And the code is kind of interesting. You can sort of see the code slowly sliding up the screen. It's almost done, though. So we uh, teleport next one of the Daleks, kill it with the sonic screwdriver, and force the other one to run into the other Dalek, which kills it. And that's the next uh, point of the game. Yeah. So there's uh, one new guy per level. And you can see kind of how it looks very similar to the original 1985 game there in that slide we had up. You want to show the piano roll real quick? Yeah, let's do that. So we also wanted to show you guys what all those inputs look like while we're playing it back. And this is gonna slow down the emulation of the platform slightly. Uh, we can't quite handle drawing all of the inputs quickly enough. Well, so. your computer can't handle that. <laughs> no, um, it is oh, pretty hardcore. Oh, and you wanna follow it yeah. too. Yeah, you definitely wanna follow that. So while he's showing you this, it's interesting that it's a piano roll because that's actually the predecessor, if you will, the spiritual, uh, uh, I guess you might say, grandparent of tasking. As crazy as this might sound, all the way back in the 1920s, it was ridiculously common to have a player piano at home. A lot of people thought it was pretty cool to be able to buy music from a roll store, take it home to your player piano, and pop that roll in your piano, and it would make music for you. It, it, was, it predated phonograph and other audio methods, audio so reproduction methods. While this is running, I'd like, <clears throat> I'd like to point out a couple of the things about the different colors there. The green means it's actually taking the, accepting the input from the emulator or in the, into the ROM. Red is lag frames. It's basically nothing will happen there, and it will get pretty nasty in some games. Like, I was messing around with Final Fantasy 1, and every other frame was pretty much a lag mm -hmm. frame. And it's really fun in Pokemon. You can see when Pikachu cries, it's just a stream of red lag frames. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, the game is not, a lag frame in this case means the game is not accepting input on that frame. And this will mess you up in some games. Uh, but you see this piano roll. Well, it turns out that all that a piano roll is is a scripted series of buttons to press on a keyboard. And a task is nothing more and nothing less than a scripted series of buttons to press on a controller. Now, Someone at some point with the p making piano rolls discovered that there are 88 keys on a keyboard but only 10 fingers on humans. And so they started adding extra holes. <laughs> That's basically what we can do with TaskBot because we can press more buttons faster than a human could do. 